professor in the Department of Political Science in the Masters of Public Policy program here at the University of California, Irvine. And I'll be, we've chosen to have this panel two weeks in advance of our election to highlight some of the really important and unusual issues that have been unfolding before us in the 2020 election. Um, today, we're going to be joined by Kaylin O'Connor uh, from the Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science, who's an expert on, among other things, misinformation in American politics uh, and recent offer of the misinformation age, how false ideas spread. Um, Kaylin will be addressing generally misinformation in America right now and with some attention to the issue in American politics in the 2020 election. We'll be followed by David Myers, a professor of sociology um, here at University of California, Irvine, who is an expert on social movements um, and recently wrote a wonderful book on the resistance um, in response to Donald Trump and the Trump administration. Um, we'll be followed then by Professor Mary McThomas, a professor of political science and public law at the University of California, Irvine, who has written extensively on immigration politics and citizenship and belonging in the United States. And we'll be talking about um, the implications of the Supreme Court opening uh, for the 2020 election. Finally, Professor Luis DeCipio, chair of the Department of Political Science and Professor of Chicano and Latino Studies here at the University of California, Irvine, who will be talking about uh, the Latino vote in the 2020 election. So um, I'm like all of you incredibly excited to hear what these panelists have to say about the 2020 election. I can't wait to learn from them. And uh, if you have questions for them, please don't hesitate to post them in the question and answer section. I'll be um, choosing questions to read to the panelists and will certainly have some of my own task. So with that, um, Professor O'Connor, we'd love to hear from you. All right, well, thanks for inviting me to the panel. I'm really honored to be here with these other panelists. Uh, so I thought what I would do with my time today was just talk about a couple important types of misinformation or influential content that have been swirling around in the lead up to the election and discuss some features of these cases. So what I'm gonna do is just pull out two topics that I think are relevant and interesting, briefly discuss them, and then hopefully prompt later discussion from these. So the first topic I wanted to talk about is voter fraud and disinformation surrounding voter fraud. So this is really a huge disinformation campaign. It hasn't been driven entirely by any one group, which is true of many disinformation campaigns, that there are often a lot of actors involved and it's kind of complex. But one really important group driving voter fraud disinformation is uh, the president, his administration, and then certain factions of the Republican Party in the US. So this is an issue that Donald Trump tweets about constantly. And there are many others associated with the administration like Mike Pence and Stephen Miller who have publicly said voter fraud is a really big problem. I'll, I'll say now, there is not evidence that voter fraud is a big problem in the US. There have been a small handful of cases of attempted voter fraud, but it is not a big serious issue. But so these other members of the administration have said this publicly and a lot of people in the public are picking up on this issue do believe that voter fraud is a problem. So recently election officials have been reporting that they're getting a lot of calls from citizens who are worried about voter fraud at their centers or who are calling to accuse them of voter fraud. So this is pretty widespread. The main messages in this campaign are first of all that voter fraud is rampant, that it's very common and it's influencing elections. A second typical message is that it's perpetrated largely by those on the political left in the US. The charge that undocumented immigrants are voting in large numbers is pretty typical. And then there are some specific claims along the lines of, so Trump claimed that if not for voter fraud, he would have won the popular vote in 2016. So there are these more specific pieces of disinformation. Um, now, one of the seeming large goals of this narrative is disenfranchisement. So accusations of widespread voter fraud are sometimes given as justification to purge voter registration rolls, uh, to pass voter ID laws, 
basically to make it harder to vote. And the idea is we're going to keep out all of these illegal votes, these fraudulent votes. But in fact, what happens is various groups tend to be disenfranchised illegitimately, especially those in the African American community and especially Latinos living in the US. Now, another intention of this campaign seems to be to invalidate election results that don't go as planned. So in 2016, the Trump campaign and the Republican National Legal Association, they were ready to go into action to challenge potential voter fraud cases if the election went for Clinton. Now, they didn't end up having to do that, but they were basically preparing a whole campaign to do that. And in recent months, the uh, president has been really cagey about whether he will peacefully transfer power if he loses the election next month. And so there's, you know, this disinformation is clearly playing a role in um, what may end up being an attempt to challenge a legitimate election. So I've mentioned um, there's some other parties involved in this disinformation campaign. There's a lot of domestic political groups who are willing to support this campaign are going to be sharing, you know, memes and information suggesting voter fraud is rampant. Um, actors from the Russian state have also been promoting these narratives. In many cases, they don't have to originate these narratives themselves, but can amplify some of the narratives coming from domestic sources. And doing so serves their purposes in multiple ways too. So um, these narratives obviously undermine confidence in the US electoral process. They set us up for potential conflicts over the election, and uh, they may also help keep right-wing politicians in power, which can be, uh, it seems to be in the interests of the Russian state as well. Okay, so topic one, voter fraud. Topic two that I'd like to bring up are smear campaigns. So unsurprisingly, there are a lot of smear campaigns out there against the major candidates. Um, many of these involve misinformation or disinformation. Some of them don't, uh, but can still use questionable influence techniques to give voters a bad feeling or create a stink around a candidate. Obviously, smear campaigns are not new to politics. They happen in every major election cycle. Um, if we look back, you know, there were campaigns against John McCain that he had fathered an illegitimate child. There's ongoing smears against Barack Obama that he's a Muslim, for example, or not from the US. Um, in 2016, we saw the Clinton email server uh, smear campaign where there was a relatively minor offense sort of blown out of proportion. This time around, we've got things like Kamala Harris is not actually black. Um, this is obviously aimed to peel off support for her from the black community. We have attempts to connect Hunter Biden with the Ukraine and indicate that Joe Biden is working with agents from the Ukraine. Um, so we got all of, this is not new, but what I wanna pull out here is that our new media structures allow these campaigns to take different forms in recent years. And in particular things like memes with pictures and emojis and videos are now shared very widely and play key roles in these campaigns. And they're often able to convey false content or misleading impressions very efficiently. And the visual imagery involved is often very effective at making some target look ridiculous or corrupt or efficiently getting this misinformation across. So I thought I would just share a couple of these to kind of give the picture. So here's an anti-Trump meme of the sort. Um, you can see his face looks brown and his skin behind it looks white. And it says, when you lean in too close while opening the oven. So this isn't misinformation. It doesn't contain false content that you're meant to pick up. Like now I believe Trump got a burnt face from the oven. Um, that's not the point. The photograph is unflattering and the text is mocking. So it's meant to amuse and to make Trump look ridiculous and it can succeed because of this visual element that um, past misinformation couldn't always include. Uh, here is another example. Here we have um, this picture of Barack Obama kind of leaning over and whispering something to Biden. And these words have been included. Soros just called Kamala Harris is your VP pick. I'll note that some of these are almost similar to political cartoons, but you don't have to be a highly skilled illustrator to make them. Anyone can make them. 
um, the image here allows for a lot of information to be implied very efficiently. I think there's nine words in this meme, but from it, we get a connection between Obama and Biden and an idea of Obama sort of still pulling Biden's strings, an idea that George Soros is pulling all of their strings. Um, all of this comes across in just one sort of simple visual image. Uh, and I'll just bring one more up. Um, here's another anti-Trump one. This picture is used in a lot of memes. It says one condom could have prevented this, meaning the birth of Donald Trump support Planned Parenthood. Um, again, this is one that makes use of an unflattering photograph. So it makes him look like a blowhard and kind of ridiculous. And so again, you're left with amusement, mockery, this feeling of judgment. And again, um, just nine words are able to do that. So these have become these kind of important sources of influence or propaganda in recent campaigns. Uh, in this case, the responsibility for these memes is very distributed. So some of them come from organized groups like Russian agents or other states you know, from China or other domestic political groups. Many, maybe even most of them are just from independent users who aren't organized, but some of these people will spend an awful lot of time trying to make this meme-like content and spread it. And most of it doesn't go anywhere because uh, there's so much of it, but then some of the more compelling ones really do get picked up and spread pretty far. So I'll end there, just reiterate these topics for later discussion, voter fraud, disinformation, mostly perpetrated by the right members of the right wing in the US, and then these smear campaigns taking on new forms um, because of new media structures that can be quite efficient and effective. Oh, Grant, you're muted. Graham. Thanks. <laughs> Great moderation. Um, our, our next professor, uh, panelist is Professor David Meyer uh, of the Department of Sociology, and because I was muted, I just want to reiterate my my praise for that. That was fascinating, uh, Professor Connor. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I am also really glad to be here. I enjoyed Professor O'Connor's picture, pictures, and her talk. I've got mostly pictures for you. Okay, so I write about social movements and mainstream politics. A major contention in my work is that social movements, the politics of protest is really deeply connected to mainstream politics in America. And I love the stuff I study and I meet people in Irvine at the grocery store. I used to meet people in Irvine before the pandemic at the grocery store, at the swimming pool, in a garden. And they say, what do you study? And I say, I study social movements. And over the last 25 years, they always say, oh, these must be particularly interesting times for you. And I always say, absolutely. But now I really mean it. So as soon as Trump came into office, there was a women's march the day after he was inaugurated, the largest mass event in American political history, followed almost immediately by the demonstrations at the airports protesting the so-called Muslim ban. And if you look carefully in the photos of all of those um, airport demonstrations, you'll see people wearing pussy hats. Then you'll see the March for Science. The March for Science had absolutely the best slogans for us geeky academics. Show me the data. What do we want? Social change based on what? Peer review at an appropriate time. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the precipitant. Man, it's great. And the um, kids from Parkland, Florida, who instituted, who in, invigorated a gun control movement, a movement that continues against family separation. Yeah, that's still going on too, okay? And over the past summer, even more, vigorous, volatile, sometimes scary demonstrations to end the social strictures that came with the pandemic. Okay. You see guns on the, on the uh, steps of the Michigan Capitol in East Lansing, Michigan. You see the George Floyd demonstrations, which is really a resurrection and invigoration of the Black Lives Matter campaign. And 
incredible pictures of brave health professionals standing up against the open up people saying, maybe you should stay closed for a while. Social movements influence the coming election, doing what social movements do. They set an agenda. They put issues on the agenda for public attention. Okay? And over the uh, four year period of the administration, there were so many that they're not all listed here, immigration, guns, abortion, science. All of them or almost all of them hijacked, superseded by the debates about the COVID-19 pandemic. The open up protests, okay, that's a, um, a variation on an old Planned Parenthood um, poster. My choice not to wear a mask okay, versus public safety. Doctors demonstrating for personal protective equipment, that's PPE. Movements educate and politicize people as demonstrated by the Me Too movement, which also took off in this period, as demonstrated by the Black Lives Matter movement, which came back in the Trump administration. Okay. Educate and politicize. I'm with Cap. Colin Kaepernick started his protests when Barack Obama was still president and was pilloried. And now through the uh, fuzzy gauze of history, he's become a hero. Social movements build organizations and connections. Indivisible came straight after Trump came into office, the brainchild of two Democratic operatives who were out of office and thinking, how can we make the world better? Giving practical advice via the web, via an online site about how to influence your congressman or congresswoman. Spread all across the United States, you see these maps everywhere. And there's so many dots. And if you pull in close, you see more and more dots. Build organizations. Moms calls for gun sense. Moms demand action for gun sense. Moms get out the vote. Okay. Um, science. They stoke and direct emotion. Okay. Social movements get you excited about the things you already care about and they tell you what to do. They give you a suggestion that something's important urgent and that your efforts might make a difference. Okay. <sighs> Border wall. This is just from a few days ago, a demonstration against con the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett. And you see the now iconic portrait of uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. They engage and support candidates for office. This is just a couple days ago. You know who David Hogg is? David Hogg was one of those incredible Parkland kids. He came to Irvine a couple of years ago in 2018 to try to stoke the uh, voter turnout in an election. He was with another bunch of Parkland kids and he had decided to take a year off. The only school he'd been admitted to was UC Irvine. And I said, well, you know, if you come here, you could take my class. And he said, thank you, that's very kind of you. He was very polite. Anyway, he says, I don't often raise money or command public attention, ha. But Lucy McBath is an inspiration. She lost her son to gun violence and then ran for Congress in Atlanta and won. I've taken on a goal of raising $100,000 for her this week. There's Lucy McBath who won and is now favored to win re-election. You may recognize who she's with. That's Emma Gonzalez, also from the Parkland kids. Emma Gonzalez is the uh, shaved head kid who is a charismatic speaker, a theater kid before college. And for about two years, every six weeks or so online, I would see Emma Gonzalez would send a note to um, Lucy McBath and said, your work keeps me going. And then six weeks later, Lucy McBath would send a note to Emma Gonzalez, it's your work that keeps me going. Social movements link issues and build coalitions. Jacqueline Corrin, who's also one of the Parkland kids, is there with Martin Luther King's granddaughter, Yolanda King. Okay. That's an open up protest again in Michigan. And the issue of gun rights gets connected with the issue of open up. Okay. That's Greta Thunberg, who came to the United States by sailboat to talk about climate change 
and said the Parkland kids were her inspiration for doing something. They mobilized voters. You probably can't quite see that, but there's Emma Gonzalez painting vote on the sidewalk, okay? More than I have ever seen, the social movements of today on the left are pushed toward electoral participation. Okay? There's a Black Lives Matter demonstration where there's a voter registration table, ubiquitous now. Okay? Today we protest, tomorrow we vote. Really important to recognize that the idea of being engaged in a social movement is not or conventional politics, it's protest and politics. Therefore, heading to conclusions. Okay. <sighs> high participation in the coming election, high polarization, intense engagement. Okay, that's a really disturbing uh, graphic that every political scientist that UCI has seen every morning for the last four years. It's from 538, it's public approval for Donald Trump, which has never been very high but doesn't really drop below 40% anyway. And all the events, child separation, COVID, um, fine people on both sides don't seem to move the needle very much. Ugh. The election is gonna happen in two weeks. There are gonna be results, but there's not gonna be a resolution to these highly politicized and polarized times. My own read is the anti-Trump folks are more engaged electorally. They're gonna turn more people out at the polls than the pro-Trump people and the pro-Trump movements. But it doesn't end then. There's a broad democratic coalition is gonna run right into US institutions and it's gonna be very difficult to hold that coalition together, particularly if Trump is gone and Democrats gain control of all three branch of the Cong both branches of Congress and the presidency. Um, as you can see, like Dianne Feinstein under attack by the climate change folks and now the Planned Parenthood folks too. But white nationalism is not going to go away because Trump loses an election and they're ready to mobilize again too. And it's much easier to mobilize in opposition than when your guy is in office. So disturbing conclusion to my talk, the rest of us aren't done. That's it. Thank you, David. That was fascinating. Very provocative. So for to carry forward the discussion after this. You mentioned several times um, the protests and movement emerging over the vacancy in the court. Um, and Professor Mary McThomas is here to join us and talk about the implications of this um, Supreme Court vacancy on the election and movements in American politics going forward. Yeah, so my panel is going to be, my presentation is going to be a little unlike the others. I don't have slides and it's going to be less about how it impacts the 20, um, the 2020 election, where am I, um, than these issues that are going to come up, such as abortion. Obviously, this would be a much different presentation if Ginsburg was still alive. Um, so in the interest of full disclosure, as many issues I have with the larger Department of Justice and the justice system, I am a fan of the Supreme Court. Um, at least it's ideal as the anti-majoritarian branch that protects the rights of the individual of minority groups against the tyranny of the, of the majority, that all of our constitutional rights are protected from the fickleness of the ballot box. So the justices ideally are above the partisan fray, making decisions grounded in principled constitutional and legal arguments, not based on their political views or as a result of being beholden to whoever put them in office, they ideally must make reasoned arguments that are then made public to all of us through their written decisions so that we know why they decided the way that they did. They can't just say, I'm striking down this law because that's what I wanna do. Different justices often come up with different takes. Uh, unanimous decisions are rare in most terms, but that again, ideally has more to do with different constitutional interpretations and judicial philosophies than a justice deciding a case based solely on his or her personal viewpoint about a law policy or practice. Now, my favorite example of such principled law lawmaking, if you will, decision-making is Gonzalez v. Raich. So this is the case involving California's initial legalization of marijuana for medical purposes. 
the majority found against California. And what they said is the legalization of a Schedule One drug is unlawful under the Federal Controlled Substance Act. The dissent was surprisingly made up by conservative members of the court. And they basically said, look, we don't like this. We don't like that we're on the side of those pot smoking Californians. But we've been deciding this long line of other states' rights cases using our understanding of the constitutionally created federalist structure. And the logical extension of it is if California says their residents can grow and smoke their own weed, thus keeping it out of interstate commerce, very important, we need to respect the state's sovereignty in making that decision. Now, it could be argued that they wouldn't have taken such a principled stance if the uh, majority had been poised to uphold the law, but I sincerely doubt we'd see such a dissent written today. The growing polarization of the country and increasing politicization of everything seems to have reached the highest court in the land. And don't get me wrong, we've had political courts before, but there seems to be in those courts, greater consistency in the application of their judicial principles, even if that meant people were gonna smoke weed. The shift has not been lost on Chief Justice Roberts. He is more of an institutionalist than a bomb thrower and understands that the power of the court with neither the power of the purse nor sword is its legitimacy and its authority to say what is constitutional. This is undermined if the court appears to be overly partisan. So recently, Roberts has chided his fellow justices on the petty comments they've made or for not fully justifying their decisions, and he has become the swing vote. In fact, he's been in the majority in over 90% of the court's decisions this past term, acting as a sort of like ballast, if you will. So one such case in which he was the fifth vote was June Medical Services v. Russo. So the case involved a Louisiana law that required doctors who provide abortions to have admitting privileges at a local hospital. So if a doctor has her own clinic or um, has her own practice, then she still needs to be credentialed by Louisiana hospital. Many of the hospitals are Catholic. Not surprisingly, they deny admitting privileges to anyone who might provide um, abortions. The very similar case was decided in 2016 involving a Texas law that was trying to do the same thing. The court in that decision, Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstead, struck down the Texas law as it was determined that there is no medical necessity for such regulation regarding admitting privileges. The majority concluded that the intent was in fact to limit the ability of women to exercise their right to abortion. Roberts dissented in that case, claiming that the law did not impose an undue burden um, on a woman's right to choose and was therefore constitutional. Then in June Medical Services, he not only reverses course, he actually writes the majority decision in knocking down this law. And most of the decision is about the importance of stare decisis, of following court precedent, in this case, whole women's health, very much mimics O'Connor's majority um, decision in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which upheld Roe v. Wade. While also eviscerating it, that's another matter we might wanna talk about. So in this, the June Medical Services decision reads as this kind of call for stability, for putting institutional norms above politics, Needless to say, the dissenting justices uh, were not at all happy about Roberts' defection. They called foul because, you know, how could Roberts laud a precedent that he had argued shouldn't be decided that way? If Roberts thought a similar law was constitutional in 2016, why would you uphold the decision that struck it down as unconstitutional? The dissent went on to argue that a bad decision should be overturned, and in fact, Roe v. Wade is a bad decision. So kind of throwing that out there. We're now in a new term. Justice Ginsburg has died. By all accounts, Barrett will be confirmed fairly soon, uh, creating a situation in which even Robert's swing vote will not matter anymore. So what do we know about Barrett? She clerked for Scalia, shares his judicial philosophy. She is pro-life. She doesn't believe that the right to privacy is a constitutional right. And to be fair, it's not in the constitution. She disagreed with Robert's majority opinion uh, upholding the ACA, the Affordable Care Act and she claims that climate change is controversial. Roe has been under siege since it was decided, so we will certainly see challenges to it, be that personhood amendments that claim a fetus is a person under the 14th Amendment, um, or such regulations as we saw in June Medical that de facto prohibit abortion by making it impossible for anyone to provide it in the state. It should be noted, uh, the ability to get an abortion already varies widely by state. And even if Roe is overturned, that's not gonna make 
abortion automatically illegal, it just means the decision of whether to prohibit or allow abortion reverts to the states. In a recent New York Times article, um, they predicted that if Roe was overturned, abortion would become illegal in 22 states almost automatically, and that due to the closing of clinics, 41% of women of childbearing age would need to drive on average 280 miles to get an abortion, as opposed to the current average drive time of 36 miles. Conversely, California has written the right to choice into the state constitution. So not much is gonna change here other than maybe we'll become an abortion tourist destination. Uh, current conservatives of the court have suggested that in addition to Roe, Oberfell needs to be reexamined. Now this was the case that determined that the right to same-sex marriage is a fundamental right and therefore constitutionally protected. The claim of the conservative justices is that the decision was incorrectly decided and that the right to same-sex marriage should be, if not left to the state, so reverting back in the same way that Roe would do, at least mitigated when it comes up against an individual's religious beliefs even if that individual is a county clerk in charge of granting marriage licenses. So these are speculative at this point. We don't know if these are gonna come up. There are a couple of cases that we know for sure we will see very soon that will give us much more of a sense of the dynamics of the court. On the day after the presidential election, the justices um, have agreed to hear a challenge to Philadelphia's exclusion of a faith-based agency from its foster care system because the agency will not work with same-sex couples. So once again, we have religious beliefs up against the rights of LGBTQI individuals. On November 10th, the justices will hear yet another challenge to the ACA. The case, Texas v. California, basically pits red states against blue states plus the House of Representatives, which is interesting. Um, the 2012 decision, which is the one Barrett doesn't like, upheld the ACA um, in finding that that fine that was for those that do not meet the minimum essential coverage requirement was a tax and therefore a constitutional use of um, congressional taxing power. In 2017, Congress got rid of the tax penalty. So there's two questions coming out of this. Does a removal of the individual mandate, aka the tax penalty, delink the act from that congressional taxing power and therefore re-raise the question of whether the entire act is, is constitutional or not, or is it an overreach on the part of Congress? Secondly, can the individual mandate be severed from the rest of, of the act as opposed to central to it, which if they say it can be severable would allow other aspects such as the protection regarding pre-existing conditions to remain in place. So if you're watching the Barrett confirmation hearings, why every time she got asked about ACA, she kept talking about severability, that's why. That question, rest on statutory, not constitutional interpretation. So in this, this idea of what was congressional intent when they wrote this, um, the justices for the most part defer to Congress and saying, well, you know what you meant with that statute. Uh, whereas if it's constitutional interpretation, they're like, we're the ones who know the constitution, not you. So the fact that the House of Republicans has signed on to this matters very much. Uh, the court has also agreed to hear Trump v. New York, which involves uh, counting unauthorized residents in the census. The text of the constitution states that the census must count the whole number of persons in each state. Legal precedent is that everyone is counted regardless of legal status. And in this recent case, the lower federal court said unanimously, this isn't even close. The answer, obvious answer is to include everyone. And of that three judge panel, two of the three are Trump appointees. The justices have also granted to review um, a case involving funding for Trump's border wall as well as the legality of the Trump administration's remain in Mexico policy, uh, which allows the Department of Homeland Security to return immigrants uh, seeking asylum to Mexico, regardless of where they came from, and then wait there uh, while they're waiting for a hearing from the US Immigration Court. There's also a good chance we'll see some continuation of Trump's legal battles reappear in the Supreme Court. Uh, Trump v. Vance decided last term involved the New York State Attorney subpoenaing uh, Trump's financial records Trump argued that he had absolute immunity. All nine justices said, no, you don't. That's not a thing. Um, seven of them said, yes, the state attorney general uh, can indeed subpoena your records, uh, any sitting president's records. So your, his, Trump's only recourse is the same that any citizen has to try to quash a, a subpoena. No man is above the law. Also a lot of precedent there, uh, most notably involving Nixon and Clinton. So some of these cases, like the census, are dealing with settled law. As a result, if any of these decisions are decided in a nakedly political manner, 
we're going to have our answer on kind of what to expect in the coming years. Thank you so much. Uh, just am amazing, the consistent theme being how little is going to be resolved by this November 3rd election and how much we'll be learning um, both about social movements and misinformation and the courts in, in the months to come. So that was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, our final panelist is Professor Louis DiCipio. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Graham. And you know, we criticize the Zoom era, but I am really pleased that my colleagues' pets are now part of our scholarly discourse. I enjoyed Zealand Kalen's cat and Mary's dog. Uh, my dog is a little shy. Um, he hasn't come in my office when I'm on Zoom, but I'm sorry you don't get a chance to meet him. Um, my uh, goal today um, is to talk about the role of the Latino vote in the 2020 elections. And I want to start out with some good news. Um, there's been a long-term trend uh, going back to about the 2000 election where the growth in the electorate has been driven um, by registering new Latino voters. Um, about 38% of the growth over that period um, between uh, 2000 and uh, 2018 uh, was new, newly registered Latino votes. Um, and the share of the, the newly registered white vote is relatively low. And this, I think, is part of the concern that uh, President Trump was able to um, seize upon in the 2016 election. Um, this trend has continued. Obviously, uh, COVID has, has slowed some registration rates, but the growth in the electorate overall is, is fueled by, by non-white voters. Um, that leads to a phenomenon in, in 2020 that we've never seen before, and that is that Latinos are the second largest uh, group of registrants um, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the electorate. Um, overtaking the African American population. This has led, I think, to some false reporting that Latinos will be the second largest electorate. Um, they quite possibly, uh, they probably will not be um, because Latinos tend to turn out at somewhat lower rates um, than do African Americans. Uh, if historical trends continue, and I think all groups will probably go up a little bit in 2020, um, non Hispanic whites and, and African Americans turn out uh, in the mid 60s uh, of, of, of all eligible adults. Uh, Latin, uh, Latinos and Asian Americans turn out in the high 40s. As a result, I think Latinos will still be the third largest electorate, uh, but um, the you know but the, the trend lines are up. So to the degree that we're thinking about not just 2020 but the future, we are going to see a progressively um, less white electorate, and um, probably an over, you know Latinos will uh, in 2024, 2028 over over turn out at higher rates than, than African Americans. Um, the gaps between Latino turnout and non-Hispanic white turnout um, can be overcome, but I think uh, COVID to some degree um, slows this process. So why is there this gap? Well, quite simply, Latinos are less likely to be asked to vote than are non-Hispanic whites and African Americans. Um, these are my estimates, but I think they're pretty accurate using sort of my estimation of what the um, uh, battleground states are uh, just about 23, 24% of Latinos in 2020, this is using 2016 data, but applying it to 2020, um, live in battleground states where for non-Hispanic whites and African-Americans, it's closer to a third. You're much more likely to be asked for your vote and you know, given the, the sort of encouragement um, to turn out um, if you live in one of those battleground states than you are if you live in California where you know, the election is going on. Uh, but most of us um, uh, have the chance of, of not paying a great deal of attention. Um, there are also some compositional differences between uh, Latinos and, and particularly non-Hispanic whites. Latinos are younger. Um, Latinos have lower incomes. Latinos have less formal education on average, and these all predict turnout in American elections. They can be overcome, again, with mobilization, but that mobilization um, is uh, less likely to occur when your votes aren't needed uh, for uh, a specific outcome for uh, the allocation of electoral college votes in the presidential race or for a Senate race or, or a, con a congressional race. Latinos, in part because they're younger, move a little bit more often, so they fall out of registration. Um, and again, sort of the hyper federal system of, of, uh, of certifying your eligibility to vote, the registration process works to their disadvantage. Um, Naturalization, which has been an engine of, of growth for the Latino electorate going back to 2000, uh, those data that I showed you earlier, um, has slowed in part because the Trump administration has throttled 
um, naturalization, and then COVID has put an effective stop at new naturalization. Uh, finally, uh, a reason for that gap, relatively few Latinos are on the ballot um, compared to uh, non-Hispanic whites and, and Blacks. About 1% of elected officials nationwide are Latino. Um, Latinos make up 14 or 15 percent of the population. So clearly there's a there's a big gap there. Now let's look specifically at, at 2020. Um, what's unique, what might mobilize higher than average Latino turnout or higher than average Latino influence in some of those battleground states? Um, well, <laughs> to, to, to be gentle, uh, President Trump is not highly regarded in Latino communities. Um, uh, recent polling, um, this from uh, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials and Latino Decisions, um, shows that uh, about 43% of Latinos uh, think that President Trump is actively, openly hostile to the Latino community. This is not a, a good basis from which to try to build support. I should acknowledge that these rates of not caring too much and being hostile are comparable uh, to the rates for, uh, for um, for 2016. Um, I think there's moderate enthusiasm for Biden, probably a little bit less than there was uh, than, uh, than the enthusiasm that Latinos expressed for uh, Secretary Clinton in 2016. About 60% of Latinos say that uh, Biden and the Democrats are doing a good job, um, and um, about a third uh, say that uh, the Democrats and, and, and Biden don't care too much. Enthusiasm um, for uh, voting in 2020 is high in Latino communities, interestingly not as high as it is in non-Hispanic white communities and African-American communities. Uh, about 60% uh, of Latinos uh, report in a recent poll, this is a weekly poll, so you know, I have some data over time, um, Latinos are more enthusiastic about voting in 2020 than they were in 2016, slightly less, as I say, than the population as a whole. About half of Latinos have been contacted by a party or a candidate. These rates are creeping up, but again, not surprisingly, because Latinos are less likely to live in battleground states, uh, these rates are lower than for the non-Hispanic white population. There's certainly been some targeted outreach by the candidates. Um, uh, Vice presidential candidate, our Senator Kamala Harris has, has um, had some Latino rallies. So has President Trump for that matter. Um, though here, I would warn you about the so-called ricochet pander that by reaching out to Latinos, uh, President Trump is able to assert to some of his potential supporters, moderate whites, um, that he's not as racist as, as they might think he is. So the, the value of a Trump Latino rally may not be uh, to win Latino votes. Where is the race right now from what we can tell? Um, as of last week, uh, the, the new data will be released tomorrow. Uh, Biden has about two thirds of the Latino vote, um, Trump about a quarter of the Latino vote and a very small share of undecideds. These rates sort of shock the media when they look at them, but they're roughly in line with sort of what we've seen over the last four or five presidential elections. My suspicion is that the Biden rate will creep up into the low 70s uh, by election day, but that's, that's about where the Latino vote is. There is a core of about a quarter of Latino voters who, who support Republican candidates, even a Republican candidate as antagonistic uh, to the community uh, as President Trump. Uh, these uh, national, this national average, of course, masks extreme state to state variation and state to state variations that could have impact on outcomes. Um, so in Florida, uh, the latest poll and, and polling at the state level of Latinos isn't terribly reliable. So don't, don't read these figures too carefully. Uh, uh, Vice President Biden has supported about 57% of Latinos in Florida and 39% for Trump. This is potentially a very important uh, division because Florida is so contested. There you have a core of, uh, of uh, pro-Republican Latino voters, particularly Cubans in the Miami area, though some religious conservatives, um, that traditionally have Florida uh, voting at somewhat higher rates for Republican candidates than nationally. The Clinton years and, and to some extent um, uh, uh, Vice President Gore had nipped into that, but Florida seems to be, at least right now, reverting to the mean. Um, Texas also much more evenly divided. Here in California, um, uh, about 73% of Latinos uh, support uh, uh, Vice President Biden. Uh, that I think will, will creep up as well. So where will Latino influence be felt? Um, well, uh, the, the most obvious case I think is Arizona. Here, a steady growth in the Latino electorate and a movement of, of, of suburban uh, whites into the Democratic camp, or at least willingness to support a Democratic candidate, has made Arizona competitive. It was competitive in 2016. People sort of lost that uh, that because of the um, the outcome of the election. But 
Arizona is steadily becoming more purple and slipping into blue in some elections because of changes in the composition of his electorate, including uh, the Latino vote here, uh, both in the Senate um, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Kelly and um, in the presidential race, you see a slight Democrat, well, strong Democratic lead in the, in the case of the Senate and a slight Democratic lead um, in the case of the presidential race, potentially a state then that could flip uh, to the Democratic camp because in part of Latino votes also of suburban white votes. Um, I think whatever the outcome in Florida, somebody will make a claim that Latinos were influential, um, but how that influence is gonna be felt um, is, is not so obvious. Um, it's interesting to see that um, Senator Harris has been focusing her Latino outreach on Florida, sort of a sense that that's where the Democrats can invest in the Latino vote and get a payoff if they should win in a narrow victory. And you know, Florida elections are incredibly evenly divided. So a small movement uh, of any electorate in any sort of direction um, can have some influence. Um, if the race comes down to, as I suspect it will, some of these, the battleground states that we're seeing now, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, North Carolina, here, Latino influence will be more muted just because they're smaller electorates, three and a half, three to three and a half percent. Um, you know, I think getting up to four percent. But you know, in a race such as 2016, where you know the the outcome was divided decided by 10,000 votes or 30,000 votes in, in in some states, if you can show some evidence of Latinos moving into the electorate in larger than expected numbers, a claim can be made of Latino influence will be made. I'm always a little dubious of those, but in, in an election like this, small movements again have some impact. We shouldn't miss the broader fact, though, that because Latinos have been steadily moving into the electorate, as I showed you in my initial slide, and steadily voting at, at you know, even at the rates they were before, meaning more votes, um, states that were formerly purple or even leaning Republican are now pretty solidly Democrat. Uh, so looking here at California and New Mexico in the 1990s, um, and Virginia and Nevada in the, in the the aughts and, and the 2010s. So the Latino electorate's impact is incremental and there will, I think, be one of those sort of movements that becomes more permanent um, in, in a state like Arizona. Some see Texas as a battleground. I'm a little more dubious of that myself, though actually some of the polling is incredibly close right now. Certainly if the Democrats are to win, um, they, they have to turn out suburban voters, which is where they're putting their efforts, but they also have to turn out Latinos in the Rio Grande Valley. And there they haven't been making as much of an effort so far. Um, just so that we don't get lost entirely in, in presidential races, um, there could be some Latino influence in some, um, some of the subnational races. I've mentioned Arizona already, uh, Colorado, you know, a state that's reliably Democrat because of Latino votes there, potential Senate flip, likely Senate flip, I think, by the latest polling there. And in some very close races, again, North Carolina and the two Georgia Senate races, um, you know, Latinos are have to be a target of democratic growth, whether they're making that investment, um, particularly in Georgia is unclear though. One of the Georgia races actually will, you know, won't really be decided, uh, it seems until, so till January. This list is relatively short. Handful of Senate, uh, sorry, handful of house races um, that are contested and um, in some cases likely to flip parties will build on Latino votes, probably most important of these, um, Texas 23, which is the very long district that stretches from San Antonio to El Paso along the border, has been elected by an African American, or has been represented by an African American Republican, uh, will likely be uh, represented uh, by a Filipina Democrat who has a Latina surname, can't hurt in that district. Um, number of the other uh, Texas districts that are likely to flip the big suburban Houston district, the suburb, one of the big suburban Austin districts, and a big suburban Dallas district all have 30, 40% Latino electorates. So to the extent that the Democrats can flip these from, from Republican to Democrat, it will be built on, um, on Latino mobilization in those districts. Uh, on that note, I thank you and I look forward to your questions. All right, so if, if you have questions for the remaining 10 minutes of discussion, please, um, please add them to the question and answer feed. Um, panelists, if you had reactions or questions, raise your hand and I can, some of the most interesting questions come from each other. Um, Lewis, it's a very 2020 moment when you had in one of your slides that um, masks, something masks the variation. And I'm like, wait, has he studied Latino reactions to masking? It's a very COVID moment. Um, what I wanted to do um, with a number of really interesting questions come forward, but I wanted to put one to all of our panelists because um, as a you know director of the Center for the Study of Democracy, this is what keeps me up at night and wakes me up early in the morning, which is that each of you 
um, you know, have given us presentations on very different features of our American political life. Um, but what what is your view on the state of American democracy in this moment from the from your area, from where you're working? Um, you know, the the impact of social movements, um, the stability of the judicial system. Um, and, you know, what should we be looking for going ahead um, and what can be done? So a broad question, you can react to it as, as quickly as you like, but um, what are you thinking about given your expertise about the health and state of American democracy in this moment? Um, Kaylin, since you went first and you have um, some interesting insights into misinformation, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, we're screwed, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hopefully I'm just kidding. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll just bring up like some of the things that I've been kind of advocating for around trying to control and lessen the impacts of misinformation and influence campaigns. So I think this is something that we need to be treating as like a major threat to our democracy and also to public health as a result of that. Um, and along those lines, it should be the kind of thing where we're responding at many social levels, at the individual level, obviously platforms, social media platforms should be responding to misinformation threats. Traditional media needs to be thinking about the role it plays in influence campaigns and misinformation. And then of course, at the government level and in academia. So we should be thinking of this as a social problem that's serious enough that we need to be treating it sort of throughout society. Um, I like to think of it as similar to environmentalism, where if we want to keep our informational environments clean, we need everyone to sort of be part of this effort. I know that's quite vague because the details get murkier, um, but that, that's sort of the general picture that I've been trying to push on people. It's, it's all of our responsibility. I can second, we're screwed. Um, so with the court, as I said, you know, I, I love it for the anti-majoritarian, but it also means that it is this unelected, zero accountability to the electorate, making these huge decisions, um, nine people making these decisions. And we have seen the biggest power grab of all time, first with Garland, then with Barrett, where they have stacked the court. And so now this, you know, calls about packing the court, which when, at one time would have been kind of unthought of just because it's been a set number for about a hundred years now seems like the most fair option. And that's insane. Um, yeah. So I don't know if we're, we're like so screwed or I'm hoping that we're not. Um, I think a key issue, and I'm concerned with people who protest, is the declining trust in American political institutions. Social movements can only be effective, can only change the world if they have something to bounce against that has the capacity to affect change. And because uh, trust in our institutions has declined so precipitously, uh, you know, it's like that line from, um, from Hemingway, how did you um, go bankrupt? Gradually then suddenly, well, that's what's happened to our faith in our institutions. And we see the court falling apart in the, American, in the eyes of the American public now. And bizarrely, the president of the United States is interested in respect for himself as an individual, but not in the institution of the presidency, nor even in the people he appoints to do his work for him. And that stuff is contagious. Distrust is contagious. So the next president will have the unenviable task of trying to rebuild respect for institutions while changing the world at the same time. And social movements that mean to change the world have to resurrect efficacious institutions that can actually do stuff. And that's not an easy thing to do. Um, I, I share the concerns of my colleagues. Um, so I'm going to sound con contrarian here by being vaguely optimistic. Uh, but the, the, the energy that I see in the social movements on the energy I see in sort of new immigrant communities making demands for their rights and, and moving into citizenship and then um, um, then voting and, and other forms of participation um, gives me some optimism. That said, it's it's our collective job uh, to ensure that they have an environment that everybody has an environment um, in which they can they can demand and and routinely receive their political needs. So, you know, the, the rhetoric of, of this election being the moment, most momentous um, in, in our lives 
um, you know, is one is one that I share, and, and its outcome. So we have about two weeks to figure this out. Um, you know, we'll <laughs> we'll show if I'm at least on the path to being having a ground for optimism or uh, being uh, completely befuddled with age. We have very little time and, and some really outstanding questions in the feed. So to those who have raised them in the chat room, I will make sure to pass these on to our panelists. Um, perhaps they can share their reactions at a later point. Um, so I'll give us one final question um, from Professor Simone Chambers to conclude, but I'm gonna broaden it out a little bit. Um, she asks, do we have a sense of the differences from 2016 and 2020? Um, and she is specifically interested in disinformation, but so many of the things we've talked about today from Latino turnout to Supreme Court politics, to disinformation, to social movements have continued to force themselves onto agenda over the last years. What's changed since 2016? What have we learned um, moving forward? Here's a little one. Donald Trump is more successful in mobilizing young people on the left than Hillary Clinton was. And that's a key thing that's gonna matter in this election. Um, with respect to you know, misinformation and dif disinformation, I mean, Professor Chambers asks, is there less of it or is it less effective or more? Um, there's definitely not less. If anything, it seems like it has increased in quantity and often in quality, or at least has changed in um, what type it is. So one thing we keep seeing with misinformation and disinformation is as we get a handle on one type of it, it morphs into new types. So the people making it figure out something else that we don't understand that well to use. So for example, you don't see that much fake news anymore. Instead, we see more things like the kinds of memes I was sharing or conspiracy theory videos. Um, and I think this actually points at something in the future. It's not the kind of thing we're gonna be able to understand how it works and control it. It's always gonna be a kind of shifting amorphous thing that grows and changes um, as the political context changes and as people become more aware of whatever particular types of disinformation have been used in the past. And I, I don't think it's less effective for that reason, because even as fake news becomes less effective maybe, these other kinds of forms can emerge and be as effective as before. Um, I th well, the biggest difference is manifested by the way we're talking to each other. Um, there's a, a global health crisis that has changed the lives of many people, but probably most importantly for the, for the political world has ensured that President Trump hasn't been able to control the agenda um, in a way that he was in the in the 2016 race. Um, and polling is pretty consistent in finding that the majority of the American people, um, including probably most importantly independents, do not think he's handled the crisis very well. And sort of every time he opens his mouth, he, he reinforces that message. So the, the, the global pandemic has changed all of our lives, but has also changed the nature of the political debate. I think another important difference with 2016 is the 2016 polls were bouncing all over the place. What has been remarkable this time is that polling has been pretty consistent. I mean, there's a little more of it, which probably uh, excludes some of the, you know, the, the bounce. Uh, but the, uh, you know, not much has changed, and that doesn't mean that, you know, if you're ahead by one point in Florida, you're going to win. Uh, what it means is that's truly a battleground state. But if you're ahead by eight points in Michigan, and you've been ahead by eight points in Michigan uh, for three months, it means you probably are going to win, and that's not a battleground state. Um, probably the third uh, difference is that President Trump is more of a known quantity um, in 2020, um, and that ensures that um, you know there's there's a relatively large share of the electorate that is uh, you know is, is less open to his message. And as David pointed out, there's 40 percent or 42 percent that's pretty consistently open to his message, but the other 53 percent um, is also pretty consistent. Well, with that, um, we'll, we'll draw our discussion to a close. Um, we'll make this available, this recording available on the School of Social Sciences and the Center for the Study of Democracy's website. Um, what a remarkable 
discussion. Thank you so much to our panelists. I hope I you know, run into you in a socially distanced way and can learn more about what you're researching because I have so many questions. Um, and I know that we all benefit from the discussion. So thank you so much um, and uh, look forward to hearing from you all again. Um, for those in the audience, the Center for the Study of Democracy, the Department of Political Science is hosting a post-election discussion on November uh, 17th, two weeks after the election, where we may know or we may not know what's happened. So with that, um, I look forward to seeing you again for that. And thank you so much to everybody, participants and panelists for, for participating. Thank you so much.